Hey guys, uh, Will Chandler here, Guardian Fury. Um, I wanted to just talk about my experience yesterday at the Kingdom Hall and afterwards. And so yesterday they had a, there was the January 2019 study edition that they were covering uh, in the Watchtower study. And... Sorry about that. I had to adjust my phone for a second. And they also had a guest speaker talking about not being anxious and stuff like that. And so I guess for the year text is um, Isaiah 41.10, do not be anxious for I am your God. And I, I think it's funny that they, they choose a, a text that says I am a number of times in it, yet none of the none of the rank and file are going to even understand um, I am being their God. You know, they're not, they're not going to get that reference because, I mean, the, the couple of elders I talked to at Barnes & Noble will get it because I explained to them um, the mistranslation in their Bible, but, but most witnesses aren't going to realize the significance of, of the words I am. So that part's kind of sad. And then going through the, the study itself, was, um, you know, I, I was basically writing, a, as the younger elder put it, writing a book during their Watchtower study, because here they are focusing on not being anxious and all the terrible things that happen, but how can you have peace? How can you be comforted? How can you trust in God? How does God show his love? And, and yet, you know... 90 some odd percent of the scriptures they they quote are from the old testament and even some of the stuff they quote from the new testament is is, is out of context um as an example in in paragraph two they talk about um they say that you know isaiah recorded the words to comfort the jews blah 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 and it said that the messages were pre preserved for the benefit of not only the Jewish exiles, but also all his people since that time. And they use Isaiah 48, 40 verse 8 there, which talks about his, his words being for, for people. And then they reference also Romans 15, 4. Now Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. You know, scripture plucking, fine and good for that, I guess, if you want to. But then look at the context. Context. Go back and start reading it at Romans chapter 15, verse 1. Now, we who are strong are to hear the weakness, are to bear. So now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me, that being applied to Christ. And that is, and that is quoting Psalms 69, verse 9. And then you have verse 4, which they quoted, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So they're trying to say that, that God is, is going to Jehovah, their Jehovah is going to be the one that's going to make them not anxious. Yet, again, the scripture they choose in context points to Christ and us following Christ's example is how that happens. So even in, you know, in, their, in their second paragraph, they're already off base. And so as I wrote this stuff down and then afterwards I talked with a lot of, a lot of this stuff, I was able to talk about a lot of it uh, with, the, with the elder after, after. You know, in verse 3, it, it talks about, um, you know, even, some of us are even enduring persecution from powerful governments. Obviously, that's referencing Russia, right? And I, I wrote next to that, you know, hence, I'm a sola scriptura guy. Because what in Russia, what the Russian government said was, you know, and I even asked the elder after, I said... But that's him texting me right now, and it's 11.30 at night. This happens almost every night. 
and and so and I, I don't mind that i think it's a good thing that he he wants to talk to me i think that's that's awesome so and i, I spoke with him and his wife at length about this after uh, about well why why did russia why is russia now coming down harder on the witnesses than they were at first and well, they had told, and I asked them, "Will you use other other translations and versions of the Bible?" And like, can you do that? You just have to use yours. Do you just have to use the the New World uh, translation? And they they both said that no, we can use any version. So I said, "All right." So taking that into into account, what Russia said was use a different translation, and don't use any of your literature. <laughs> That was what, that was what Russia said. So, if they were just sola scriptura, using only the Bible, they would have been fine if they just used a Bible other than the New World Translation. But they refused to do that in Russia, and hence Russia's coming down on them. So, I even brought that up, like, that's self-inflicted. When all you had to do was use a different translation of the Bible and the Bible only. So what's happening to your you know, brothers and sisters in Russia is a self-inflicted wound. And then it it's, goes on. Uh, anyway, then it starts talking about I am with you. And I, I think it's funny. Again, they're using all this Old Testament stuff. But who is going to who, who is going to be with us? Like, was God going to be with us? Look at Emmanuel. The definition of Emmanuel is God with us. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In him the fullness of deity dwelt bodily, as in Colossians 2.9. So again, the, that's the reason they don't want to be using the New Testament, I think, is because it all points to Jesus. They're using all Old Testament. Well, not all, but almost all Old Testament. And some of the New Testament stuff they use, they, they pluck it out and, and read it out of context. And then look at what does, uh, it says here for the, one of the questions on paragraph four, in what ways does Jehovah express his feelings? And again, they, they give this Old Testament stuff that doesn't really, cor really correlate. And I wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six scriptures sitting there when they were reading when they, after they read this question, I wrote down six scriptures that talk about the gospel and how God showed how he felt for us, expressed his feelings for us uh, in 2 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Acts 20, 24, Galatians 3, 29, Colossians chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 4, John 14, 16 through 21. It's all, it's, it might be 27, I don't know. I think it's 21. So, again, New Testament's all, all speaking about this. And then you go to 1 John 4, 7 through 12, which even makes a greater case for how God has shown us that he is with us. But again, those also all point to Christ. They all point to Jesus. And, and then you go to uh, paragraph 5, and it asks, you know, how... How do we know that Jehovah is interested in helping us with our trials? Well, because he sent Jesus. Like, that they don't say that. It doesn't say anything about salvation there. It, it just goes back to Isaiah again. And something that doesn't even really apply to these days, to now. Like, but they ignore the New Testament. They ignore the New Covenant. And, you know, I, again, I brought this stuff up. Um... Then you go on to some random example they have of showing that, I don't know, it's really weird, some some random illustration they have about a guy flying a plane and everything, and they try to use it as an earthly earthly son saying how great his, his earthly father is. Um, and that the testimony of, of the son is, is what, showed that his like I don't, it was it, it doesn't the, the whole thing doesn't even quite make sense it's a little bit silly but then you know again go to first john 4 chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 you know jesus showed and proved and testified of himself about the father's love 
And instead of instead of using that scripture, they make up their own analogy. When if they wanted to prove God's love for us, all they had to do was read First John chapter four, nine, and ten. And again, I'm writing all this stuff down as as this because this was the first time I saw this. I'm writing this stuff down while we're going through this study because I'm like, again, I shouldn't be surprised, but I I was, and I was like. So I'm writing, I'm basically writing a new article while they're going through their article. I'm giving proofs and writing a new article on on the real answers to some of these things, right? And then it says, like, what lessons can we learn from, from this illustration? And I, again, I just, you know, 1 Peter 3, 15, Colossians 4, 6, 1 Peter 1, 3, and... I mean, it's just, and then it says, I will, and we go on to, to paragraph 12. It says, I will fortify you and help you. It says, consider the, the assurance that I will fortify you and I will help you. And they ignore John 16, 7, where Jesus says, I am sending a helper to you. So instead of saying, instead of using something of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they use again a verse in Isaiah and they just, they make up some stuff. And only use Old Testament scriptures, yet how do we know that he's going to fortify us? Well, because Jesus said he was sending us a helper. How simple is that? You don't need all these other... That's what I mean when you go sola scriptura, when you just use the Bible, it explains itself so simply and very straightforward. And no one, no one there even that I could tell made these connections. There was no one commenting on these things. And I get into, I get into, again, you go to paragraph 13. It says, in some parts of the world, our enemies are trying to stop our preaching work or ban our organization. And I wrote in the margin there again, just use a Bible in Russia would leave you alone. You don't need literature. Just use a different version of the Bible and Russia would have left you alone. But they don't give the facts. Go to the Russian, the, the Russian courts and, and find this out yourself. It's not that hard. And then we go into some fear-mongering. And they just focus on the negative. And then they, they talk about how does, how does Jehovah fortify us and our trust and how does he work out the details. And, how, and again, they ignore... They ignore like, how, how is it that God is going to fortify, they say Jehovah, but how does he fortify us? Well, go read Romans 13, 10 to 14, and talking about putting on the armor, the armor of light. And then you look, read the other, like, look, read the scriptures in Ephesians 6, 10 to 24, and it talks about the, the armor of God, right? And it talks about the different qualities, the different pieces of armor. And, and that, again, is a New Testament saying how, they, how God does these things. But there's no mention of that, right? And and so it's kind of crazy to me. And so I talked about some of this after the meeting. Um, and I also got into a discussion about the Trinity and a different way to look at it. Because on Thursday we had talked Trinity some and the, the concept of it escaped him. And I said, well, let me give you a different a different way to look at it possibly. In light of, there is a slight, a slight ambiguity a few times with how the Greek word um, Archie is used a couple times. And so, there is, there is, in a few places you could have to look at it, not have to, but you could look at it a little, a little different. And one way I've heard the Trinity explained differently is that comparing it to Adam and Eve, like when God made Eve... He didn't, he wasn't making humanity again. Eve was from Adam. It was a piece of Adam that made made into a woman, right, according to the Bible. And so if you even think about that as, as God, if God took a piece of himself and made Jesus and the Holy Spirit, then it wasn't a creation. It was just an, a part of him. In essence, both of them would be God, the same as the Father. And so I explained that that to him, and that seemed to he seemed to take to that explanation more than he did the other one that I gave him. And then, uh, 
after talking with him, I talked to the guest speaker for, for a good five minutes, probably two, and which was interesting. Uh, I didn't say anything controversial, but I did make a few small, uh, you know, I shared the gospel a little bit with him, the true gospel, the gospel of grace, right? And the other thing I then was able to do was I offered to take out the, the younger elder and his wife to, to dinner. And they ended up accepting, and I, you know, I didn't let them pay for anything. And we ended up having a great meal, great discussion. I think we were there for four hours. I gave the waiter a huge tip because we took his table for like four hours. So I gave him enough of a tip that it would have covered probably three or four tables minimum uh, just because we were there for so long, and the waiter was awesome. So I can't complain there. And uh, anyway... And in the course of the conversation with, with me, with between me then this elder and his wife, you know, at some point he says that he's given her a brief overview of my life, and so I use that as an in. I doubt he had given her many details, but I did end up. He he gave me the opening. I did briefly talk about my rape and beating for ten years by the hands of someone that was supposed to be appointed by the Holy Spirit. And how the organization sent me back to my rapist arms, right? So I got to get into all of that. And I'm pretty sure she didn't know some of those details. Because the look on her face was uh, was a little surprised a few times. And it, it wasn't argued that maybe the organization didn't do it. You know, he even agreed that, yeah, it was handled completely wrong. So again, that's that's a good thing, right? They they know um, or believe, you know, that's a good thing. Another thing we got into again, and they gave me all these openings in the course of our conversation because then they were trying to prove to me how good the org is, right? And at one point they said, "Well, our organization is like the only one that's politically neutral," and I was like, "You're not politically neutral. You can't make that claim. Your organization is not neutral." I said, "You individually might be neutral, but your headquarters isn't." I said, you're a part of the OSCE right now. And you were a part of the United Nations for 10 years, from 1992 to 2001. And his wife like, was shocked. She was like, I can't believe that. And I was like, it's a well-known fact. You can ch fact check it. It's verifiable. And she's like, we never were part of the United Nations. I'm like, no, 92 to 2001, you were. I said, my mother's elders have even verified that. And they know about it. So... There's people in your organization that know you were a part of the United Nations for 10 years. There's people, and then I go into the OSCE, is the European Union's answer to the United Nations. It's a sister organization to the United Nations, and yet you are currently active members in the OSCE as a headquarters. So no, you're not politically neutral, and you're having something to do with the scarlet-colored wild beast. And, and it was really like we they even brought up ct russell at some at one point and i was like you don't even want to go to russell i said this is not a conversation you're gonna like if you want to start talking about russell and try to claim that he was a good guy and that he was acting with god because i can destroy that for you like go actually that helped me set the stage for in the future talking about it they're the ones that brought it up though and i said we don't, you don't want to talk about Russell tonight. It's not something you want to even, you don't want to go down that rabbit hole, you know? Now, on all of this, though, the conversation was awesome. It was good. Now, we did have back and forth. There was debate, but on my end, at least, there was open-minded debate, like, about certain scriptures, like, and, but we also had a great conversation in general. Gave them both a huge hug, a couple hugs by the end of the night. And, and went our separate ways, and tomorrow I'll be back at his house helping him work on remodeling their new place. So, I'm sure I'm leaving out a lot of details. This video is almost at 20 minutes already, though, so I'm trying to wrap it up. Plus, it's, I don't know, it's like, it's like 12.40 already, or 11.40 already, too, so it's getting kind of late. And... I got to say again how how open and sincere they are, but they're, it seems like they're a little bit, you know, duped like all of us were, right?
And they were even telling me how about becoming friends and how awesome they think this is and that they think they've found an unlikely friend in me. And I said to him later, I was like, well, if I don't become a Jehovah's Witness, then you can't be my friend, can you? Because wouldn't I be considered bad association? And of course, they don't even realize that that scripture saying bad association is quoting a secular poet of that time. It's not even God speaking there. It's Paul quoting a a, a, not a poet, a play, and using it in, in satire slash, you know, like, they don't even realize it's not God that made that said that verse, right? They don't even know that. It's, it's, it's amazing. And, but then he said, well, then he kind of was like, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, but, like, wouldn't you agree that if someone doesn't agree on some things that, you know, that would have to change the relationship. And I just wrote back, I was like, no, the status of our friendship is 100% on you. I'm good on my end. If whatever you decide's on you, that's got nothing to do with me. And uh, it was funny, he squirmed a little bit on that one. So, but again, driving home the point, the whole thing is I'm trying to get his critical thinking kickstarted, right? And... It's slow and steady is all I can say, right? Anyway, I hope you all have a good one. Uh, this is Will Chandler, Handle of Guardian Fury. And, uh, yeah, have a good night. <laughs>